Chris Trebatowski of Treb Law. Let's talk about legal issues that matter to you. I started with an opening from one of our social media posts that we started last year, and there's a reason for that. What I want to talk to you about today is not only how Clio helped me to transform my practice, but how what I learned here has helped us to grow in ways that are surprising and, in fact, shocking to me. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. For 20 years, I practiced in a big law. I was in one of the AMLA 200 firms. I was the youngest lawyer to ever head billing and collection. And by the way, if you ever have to do that, it's the worst job in the world. Um, I, I was the youngest chair of the litigation department. I was the youngest member of the compensation committee. And in those 20 years, it almost killed me, literally. Then I moved to small firm or medium-sized firms and found that it really was no different when big fees or big cases came in, it was always somebody else's, not mine. Now, how that happened, I don't know, but I didn't have the say. So, about four years ago, my wife and I decided to get married. She moved from Indiana to Wisconsin. And about four months later, we started salsa dancing. If you've seen the video that Cleo did of us, you'll see us salsa dancing. About six months later, she said to me, why are you giving all this money to everybody else? And I thought to myself, I never thought about that. Is that silly? 53-year-old guy, never thinking about that before. Later that same week, a client said to me, he said, how much of the money that you charge me do you actually take home? And I told him, and he laughed. He said to me, he said, what do they do for you to pay them that much money? And I couldn't answer the question. The next week, he, and he told me this. He said, look, I'll tell you what. I'll make you a deal. You reduce your rates 10% for me from where they are now. I will write you a $25,000 fee advance, go start your own firm, and the next week I did. And here's the story about why I think I've got a story to tell. This chart shows the revenue growth in my firm. The first nine months, $255,000, and I have to tell you that I was a little bit spoiled because the first three months things went so great, I was like, all right, yes. And then we had a month where people didn't pay their bills on time. And I thought, are you the biggest idiot in the face of the earth? I thought, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to pay the mortgage. What a stupid thing to do. But it turned out okay. The next year, we grew to 395000 in revenues, 495 the next year. And those are pretty nice growth rates. But this year was and is a standout year, we have $880,000 in revenue through today. We're projecting a million and a half dollars next year, and we have one lawyer, me. Now, you might ask yourself, how in the world is that possible? Because in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I guarantee you that I cannot charge $1,000 an hour to do what I do. Wish I could make my life easier, but I can't. So I want to talk to you about what we did and how we did it and, and how I think you can use this in your practice. Now, revenue doesn't mean a whole lot if it costs you a ton of money to generate it. So I thought I'd show you this. Here's our fixed costs. $6,950 a month. That includes rent. It includes health insurance. It includes all the software that we use. It includes my wife's salary, which she's going to tell you is not enough, which is true. She runs all of the parts of the business that I don't like to touch, which means everything other than dealing with clients. And our variable costs have averaged $7,000 a month over the cost of time, so $14,000 a month nut. That seems like a lot. 
But when you know that that was the same and has been the same for the four years that we have been in practice, or almost four years that we have been in practice, here is the true revenue growth in our firm. So the first year, I'm like, well, I made more money in that year than I did in an average year working in a medium-sized law firm. Second year, I made more money than anybody in the medium-sized law firm that I worked for two years before. The third year, I made as much money as I did when I worked in big law, and I am certain that there's not a single one of my colleagues in big law that made this much money this year in Milwaukee. And it's not all hourly rate work, and I'll talk about that later, but what we did, our strategy that we implemented was this. Let's come up with a foundation of hourly rate or fixed fee work that allows us to take risk in commercial contingent fee cases so that we can hit home runs when they're there and we can be nice and comfortable and live a happy life other than that. And it has worked and worked beyond my imagination. One of the ways that we make sure that we keep revenue coming in, and it's really important to me coming from my background, is we have to use software for billing and billing effectively. And when I say billing effectively, it means I don't spend 20% of my time, as you saw in the legal trends, on either drafting bills or collecting them. If I spend 1% of my time on that, I would be shocked. How does that happen? Well, it's a little bit easier for me because I can meet the first important part. That is to set time entry expectations. And my time entry expectations are the same that I have had when people worked on my files when I was in big law as they are today, and that is write that entry as if the client was gonna read it today, and I don't wanna touch it. I do not want to touch it. Because if I touch it, first of all, it's not real. Second of all, it doesn't communicate. And third, I might just cut time, and I don't really wanna do that. Now, for me, it's easy. For me, I have, in this firm, started with that one client, now have gone through 90 clients, 90 clients over the course of 42 months added into the firm, 115 separate matters, and of those 90 clients, they're not all distinct. Let's say there's 80, 80 or so distinct clients and then related entities. And we've sent out 450 bills, and I have been questioned on time entries three times in 450 bills. And I want to talk to you about how setting t at, at time entry expectations, and then I'll tell you two of those. As soon as I explained to the client that that's what it costs to do that, they sent me a check or paid electronically. And the third one, the guy caught. It was right. I wanted to put down 0.25 for something, and I put down 2.5, and it just plain was wrong, and that's a pretty big wrong. But he chuckled it off, and we moved on from there. So, what are the effective ways to use billing software? And the first effective way is to avoid entries that require revision. Entries that require revision means more hands have to touch the bill. And when more hands touch the bill, it's a problem. Don't put in abbreviations like TC or OC or MW or whatever you want to think of. In my view, that's like putting LOL on your bill, but there's no emoji for OC. At least I don't know, maybe there is one. <laughs> that's the client emoji for it, yes. And why are these entries ineffective? And I think I talked a little bit about this, so I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. They're ineffective because bills aren't text messages. 
Bills are, in my view, one of the single most important marketing tools we have. We communicate directly with every client we work for every month to tell them how great we are and why they should pay us so much money and why they should refer us to their friends, why they should give us good reviews, and it's all in that document. And if it's not, it should be. Secondly, we talked about this before, the fewer hands on the bills, the faster the money comes in, and that's why the only person in my firm who touches time entry, my wife's gonna kill me for this, or sends out a bill, is me because it touches a client, I do it all, and I can tell you, in the month that we had 25 bills to send out, it took me 30 seconds to generate them, two minutes to approve them, and it took me longer to lick the envelopes than it did to get the bills out. Now, that was the last month I ever licked envelopes. Now I send them all out by email or Clio Connect. I get paid faster, and let me tell you how much faster this is. When I was in big law, the time that it took from when a bill went out until it got paid was 75 days. When I got done with my work on that committee, it was 30. And everybody was like, I was the hero. Man, they were making a lot of money until one month or two months later, and I wasn't there to crack their heads. And guess what? It went to 45 days, and they lost a half a month of income. They're like, ah! My, my bills turn on an average of 12 days, and that is, it excludes only one client. I've, had, I've been very fortunate. I've only had one super deadbeat client. And that is luck, but that's also good intake and good communication. Now, what you should do is try entries like these. Now, I had a partner in big law who used to routinely write down thinking. And when a client would call back and say, what is this thinking stuff? And the guy said, hey, look, you should pay me twice for that. That's the most important thing I do. Well, we're all creative. We can come up with ways to describe thinking in a way that client's gonna think, this is cool. Try this, for example. Plan strategy for boom. What is that other than thinking? And you can follow through on this by saying, Telephone conference with a client to confirm or implement the strategy while they're involved now. Go beyond that and you can say execute the strategy. Step one, research whatever it is. Then they don't say, why did you have to research that? Well, the answer is a part of strategy. I mean, that's what you got to do. And then draft step two, draft whatever you have to draft. Okay, I have to draft a motion. It took eight hours. Are you kidding me? I said, and I'll say, it only took eight hours because I can type really fast. If I had an assistant, it would have taken more. Simple time entry, there are simple time entries that work. The ones that the clients are with you at. In my area in litigation, they're really simple. They are these. Trial, everybody knows what a trial is. They were there. It's just as painful as them as it's for you. If they attend a mediation, they know they were there. If you tell them that there was a scheduling hearing, they know that. You don't need to write anything else. If you write anything else, it sounds like you're making an excuse for why your time entry is what it is. Now, th this part of my speech has changed a little bit just this weekend. Because I always use the timer function on my handset when I'm returning calls, or if I'm out of the office, if I'm in court, if I'm somewhere and I need to make phone calls, why? Because I miss that time otherwise. Even if I go back to my office, I forget it. And here is the real value in that. If you bill at the rate, that is the average rate, in the legal trends report, $267 an hour, and you miss one, 15 minute phone call a day, or a week, I'm a story, one a month, you pay for your Clio subscription 
by catching that one phone call a month and do the math because I suspect that every one of us misses more than one 15-minute phone call a month. So I do it because it avoids lost time. Now it's great. I can pick up my phone and say, open tally, start timer. I can do that from my car. Hands free. It's pretty cool. I was glad that they, to see that they did that. And the funny thing that I've really learned this last year, because some clients have migrated over from other firms that I worked at, and they said to me, hey, you know what, it's really great to get a bill from a lawyer that actually reflects the amount of time we talked on the phone. And I'm like, wow, they're keeping track of this. Well, yeah, the guy we used to work with at your old phone always used to talk about the Packers and the politics, all of this stuff, and he billed us for all of it. Well, how stupid is that? It's not that I don't talk about some of that stuff with clients. I just turn off the timer. Now, I'd say ask, and when I say ask, I'm going to put prayers around this. I'm going to say suggest with your questions. Should I email you your bill? And it's wonderful because if you do, it comes in color. You don't pay the cost of the color printing, and it's there like this. Should it come from Creo Connect? So you have electronic billing requirements. You're going to know that if a client does, they're going to have that, and Clio supports it. And what's the best time of the month to receive the bill? And there's a really good reason for that. I talked with a client who told me this. He said, bill me at the right time of the month. I said, what are you talking about? He says, if I get a bill by the 15th, I pay it by the 25th. If I get a bill by the, by the 30th, I pay it the 15th of the next month. Most companies only cut checks once a month. He was easy. I could decide, well, when do I want my cash flow? And I'd send it to him in different times of the month. But you can slow your receivables up to 45 days by missing a deadline by one day. And I do this as with every client, all new clients. I take fee advances. I don't have time to waste on people who are not going to pay for my services. It's just the way that it is. I brand the bills. We brand the bills. It's easy to do. You should do it. I believe it's another form of communication that ties you back to your firm. Now, Derek Boland is the client here, and he's the only one who's never paid me. So if he's in the audience somewhere, just poke him. On this, I do a couple of things. You notice there's no client address on here, and the reason is, is because the client knows what their address is, number one. And number two, I'm emailing this bill, so all that they need to know is where to send the payment. Second thing, what's one of the ways that they slow down sending money to you? I need your F-E-I-N number. I cannot cut you a check because I can't send out a 1099. So Cleo lets you put it right on the bottom of every bill, and I do. Not only that, but I've created a fillable PDF with my signature on it for a W-9. If somebody doesn't like this, I electronically sign it. Poof, out, there you go, no problem, now pay the bill. That usually happens when insurance companies are involved. Um, with paying claims. I do a little bit of that work, and they're not too keen on the idea of how fast I can turn around the W-9. Once you do this, it's critical you stay consistent because if you fall behind a month, you lose a month of revenue. You push it back. Once you implement these, you have to stay on top of them. And go as paperless as you possibly can. It's less expensive, it's faster. People can communicate it. They can see it on their handheld devices. They can get it where it needs to go and you get paid. Now, one of the things that I'd say is very interesting to me because when I, I have this uh, couple of clients that I just, they're, they're just delights. I, sent a bill to a lady who'd been charged $10,000 by lawyers who said, you can't do this. And she came to me, she said, really? I don't, I mean, I can't do this, really? So we litigated it. It was an estate case. I've charged her, I think, $7,500, and she won. She didn't have to do it. 
So I sent her the first bill, I think it was $2,500 on on, with a trust account letter by email, and I got an email in 30 seconds, pay, please pay yourself right away. You're doing such a great job for me. Now, don't we all want to have that from every client? And emails are like text messages. If I want to call my kids, forget about them answering the phone, but they can't help themselves but respond to a text message. And I found the same thing is true with emails and clients. Now let's talk about a little bit about what we've learned over the course of time at the Clio conference. Before we came to the first Clio con conference, now for those of you who were here last, ye last year, you know that Gary V is, a, is the child of immigrants from the Soviet Union. Well, my wife is an immigrant from the Soviet Union. So the one thing she hates is spending money on stupid shit. So, I, being stupid, decided that it would be a good idea to spend money on lead generation. And you know, we actually made $4,000 worth of fees, but the number of calls I had to take from absolute crap was a waste of time. And so, I only hear about this every six or seven hours at work when I'm going to spend the next three or four thousand dollars on something. Now, the second thing surprised me because both of us made this decision. M Magazine did a leading lawyers edition where only Avo picked who the leading lawyers were going to be. And we thought, what better place to advertise? Because it says you can't get in here by advertising. Well, didn't work. Why? I talked to some people about that, and what they told me was when they got that magazine, they thought that just like the other leading lawyer magazines in our town, like Super Lawyers, that if you bought an ad, you got in. And it's a, that's a, let's say that's just a little bit of a stretch, but not much. So they ignored it. So that was unsuccessful. Now let me talk to you about what has been successful and how inexpensive it has been. Here's our website, and it's going to be updated. Um, Inna told me that. She's in charge of this. She does the design work. All of the content, all of the pictures are ours. They're real. We own a trademark on Treblaw. We own a trademark on Because Trials Happen, and we own a trademark on TL. And yes, Because Trials Happen is something I thought of at a legal conference, and it's to match the bumper sticker. Because anybody who's never been in a trial will feel like it is a shit happens moment. Now, this website costs us about 300 bucks a year for hosting and registration. And the WordPress template was $89. And you see the 64 cents on there? That's because my wife did this and when I told you about not spending money on stupid shit, that's how much detail there is that goes into that. It's a good thing. I just have a little bit of an issue sometimes saying, why about 10 cents, really? So, but the thing is, is that most websites, unless you're gonna spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you hire Scorpion or somebody to build you one fresh, are going to be built on templates. And you can save money doing that. You need a website, but the question is, how much do you spend on it, and can you hire a college kid to put your content in it? Social media videos have been very successful for us, and in fact, if you saw the Google presentation the other day, you will, find, you will remember that YouTube is the second most searched engine. And if you search, and since I know none, no lawyers are cynical and they would not not believe me on this, if you search how do you choose the right lawyer or how do you choose the right mediator, you will find a video, not these two, but a video from my office that shows up either in second or third. And those videos we only started doing last year. And we shoot these videos wherever we go. The top one is in Mendocino. It was shot less than a month ago. We shot three videos, at least three, maybe four, here in New Orleans on Saturday and Sunday. And when we go to dance in Canada and the Canadian Championship next week, you can guarantee that we're going to shoot a bunch of them there too. 
and look at all of that equipment we have. You know, and this equipment is an iPhone. And I don't put a cost here because everybody's got a smartphone. A tripod for 15 bucks off of Amazon. Lights for $49, which we only use to shoot the inside shots. And the only things we use inside shots for right now is the intro and the video editing software, 95 bucks. Now, my wife is a graphic artist. She does the editing, but I can tell you, if you, you can hire a college kid to do these things, and if you're gonna crank out as many as we do, you need to do that. Blog posts. The blog post that you see us from, there with our teacher dance instructor was from last year's Canadian Championship, and we bombed, we finished in the last place. That is the most read blog post that I have ever made, ever. And that's why it's up there, and it's, it's for a reason. I think that there's, there are surprise content interests. There are things that catch people, bring them to you. And those things often are the things that make you human. But you want to make sure that they have content that is good for referral sources and your client or potential client. And you want to think hard because if you're looking for organic results, you have to think not what do I think I'm communicating, but what are people going to search on the internet that's going to pop something up for you. So let me tell you an example. A friend of mine is great at this. I mean, he's just amazing. He was in Wyoming. Somebody there had won a $110 million verdict against a bank. If you Google, how do you sue a bank, you will find my friend, my friend, his website will show up number one on Google in Wyoming. He's from Wisconsin writing about the Wyoming guy who did it. And he told the Wyoming guy who did it, and he's like, that can't be, it's in the paper. Well, guess what, it's true. So, it's not so much important what you think you're communicating. Don't trust other people. Think about what the question is that's gonna be searched. That's how you get organic results. Now, we have done local advertising, that's good. We love to dance, we do this. This is something I never thought was gonna make us any money. Now you'll see that when it translated here, the logo didn't translate perfectly, but this was in a perfect location. People know that we're there and we could do it on social media too. We do it with our charitable giving too, Erasing the Distance, if you're from Chicago, is a theater group that does mental health theater. And we have used that effectively as well. And there's organic results. So you see an article about me that now, I practiced for 32 years in the Wisconsin Law Journal, never wanted to talk to me. As Soon as we started going on social media, look what it says, whether in quarter on the dance floor, Trebitowski takes the lead, it's on the front page. When you're on Twitter, when you're on Facebook, there are organic results that happen over time. You'll find at first that your followers grow slow and then they grow faster. You'll be followed by influencers, and those are important follows. You'll be added to social media lists, at least I didn't know they existed. I've been added to three that Gary V is on. I'm like, really? Me? Now, I don't say, fuck as often as he does, but it's kind of cool to be on the same place. Now when you do this, you have to be patient, you have to be real, and you have to be yourself. Here's some future challenges that I see in my practice. The first one is society is fractionalized and unpredictable, and I don't have to tell you that, you see it every day. The impact and speed of disruption in increases the amount of fractionalization and, and unpredictability. And the health insurance market for a small law firm, a solo practice or small law firm, is going to be an issue no matter what happens. What do we do? Well, I believe we have to try to manage the unpredictable. And that means hiring the right consultants when you can, it means explaining to clients what the unpredictability is so they understand it. I believe we need to engage the disrupted. 
we're going to have disrupted people on our juries if we cannot talk to them because we aren't disrupted, we lose, our clients lose. And until things sort of even out, I say, take a hard look at mediation and ADR and get a good mediator. Because if you have a good mediator, you can get to an amazing result. And I'm not talking about a number shuffling judge. I'm talking about a lawyer who's been trained in mediation skills, there's good programs, there's one at Northwestern, there's one at Harvard, there are several places. If that person hasn't been trained there, do not use them, you will waste your time. And your client will get pissed and it won't work. Now it's different if you're in PI, you can do this money shuffling thing because that's what insurance companies want to do, but if you're in commercial litigation, it doesn't work. Hire somebody who knows what they're doing. Now, disruption in you, my view is this. Technology and artificial intelligence are not threats. Rather, they're part of your arsenal. Stay up to date. Stay within your capacity. We come back from Clio every year because my wife and I take separate tracks. And we come back and say, what things can we implement this year, one or two or three? Because that's all we can do. And that's what we do. There's my plug. Now, let me leave you with this thought. Last year, we were in Canada, and we went to a winery called the Foreign Affairs Winery. At the Foreign Affairs Winery, they have a big moose that says chow on it. And you go, what? How is this possible? OK? The story is a great story. I have a blog post on it. If you want to read that, it's great. But that's not the point. The point is, is every cork says this, dream and the world will conspire to make it so. And I can tell you as I stand on this stage, not as a motivational speaker, but as somebody who's done exactly what you do and exactly what you're trying to do, that it works. And we all have to dream, and if we dream, the world will conspire to make it so. Thank you.